I'm Corey, this is Liam. Um, we'd like to talk about uh, cryptography for your personal use. Um, we have some more specific things to talk about there. Uh, in particular, Liam will start us off with some motivation for why you might want to encrypt your stuff in the first place. Um, I'll give you a, a very quick overview of public key encryption, the systems that make this possible. Then we'll look at one particular software system you can use called PGP for encrypting your email and other things. Uh, and we'll finish up with a tutorial and workshop. Um, so feel free to stick around and get started using PGP yourself. Uh, if you want, you can even start downloading software that I've written up here, uh, but we'll get to that later. All right. Uh, hi. Uh, so Corey asked me to, to explain some of the reasons uh, why encryption is useful and, and why people need encryption. Because um, a, a pretty common misconception is that encryption is only for like, you know, government whistleblowers or if you have some sort of like critical data that, that you don't want to get stolen. Um, but there are actually a lot of like common uses for it. Um, so some examples of data that you might want to, you, you might want to be aware of data on you that's out there on the internet are the web searches you make through Google or through Yahoo, um, the links that you click on in those web searches, um, any emails you send that aren't encrypted, um, and chats that you have with people. So whether whether you use Facebook chat or um, some sort of messaging app. Um, so let's talk about uh, what sort of people have access to this data. Um, so one of the big ones is third-party advertisers. Uh, you may, if you use Gmail, you may have seen ads on, on the side of your email, um, or in Facebook, uh, a lot of a lot of your data is used to target ads towards you. Um, how advertising works on the internet is adver advertising companies build an online profile of you and use that in order to better target advertisements and try to get you to buy products. Um, and an uh, uh, interesting fact is actually uh, companies like, like Axiom is one of them that collect data and build online profiles of people have more data than the government does. Um, so they have, they have these giant warehouses that take up uh, like huge amounts of space in you know, central US. Um, and they have this long list of data points, about 1,500 items long. Um, uh, one thing I also wanted to mention was uh, an interesting tidbit, which is that after the 9-11 attacks in 2001, uh, the government released the names of the attackers, and they were basically pleading for anyone to come forward because they didn't have any, they, they had very little info about the attackers. And the CEO of Axiom, a data collection company, sent uh, an email to the government basically saying that they had past addresses, current addresses, who they live with, and all this info on the 9-11 terrorists. Um, so th that's one example of where it, where it could be useful. Um, but they also have things such as you know, info about the pets that you own, uh, health info, credit history. Um, and some of this data you, you may not want out there. Uh, the thing is that online profiles that are built up about you can be sold. Um, and these can show up in things like hotel, hotel and airline pricing. Um, I have a news, news headline there, which Orbitz was actually caught uh, giving pricier hotels to Mac users. Um, so that if they detected that they were using a Mac, they would price discriminate, um, as well as insurance costs. Insurance companies are another party that's really interested in the, the sort of data that they can get on people um, so they can identify you know, whether, whether you're at a higher risk of getting into an accident or something like that. Um, one thing you may not think about is also that this online data about you can be subpoenaed and used against you in court. Uh, this is a graph that Google released, a transparency report. Uh, it, it does, it's not current, it doesn't have 2013, but you can see that each year Google received more and more data requests from the government. Uh, it's now somewhere, I think for the year of 2013, it was about 30,000 data requests that they received. So it, it increases every year. Um, data that's, that's stored on you by these companies can also be snooped on by employees. Um, for example, more than once in the past, Google engineers have been fired for accessing you know, ex-wife's ex data or data that they shouldn't be looking at. Um, 
And this data can also be leaked to hackers. So if companies like Google are hacked into, sometimes uh, people will steal large amounts of this data for malicious purposes. And when it's things like health info and credit info, uh, you may not want to have random people out there with that data. Um, another, another important thing to be aware of is that with the NSA now, uh, any, any data that you, that you transmit online that isn't encrypted is supposedly spied on by the NSA. Uh, we don't know exactly how much they're keeping and what they're doing with the data, but uh, there's a quote I like from 1984 that says, basically, you have to assume that any data that you don't encrypt is out there for them to see. And that can lead to what's called chilling effects, which are when people don't, they, they won't make some sort of communication because they're worried that that might flag them under the government and that might put them at risk. Um, some, of, some examples of that are uh, activists and people who, who communicate with political activists. Uh, journalists are often concerned that publishing something or communicating about something might put them in danger. Uh, lawyers and domestic abuse victims. So um, that's all I have on, on reasons to use cryptography, and uh, I'll hand it off to Corey, who's going to explain how um, some common forms of encryption work. All right. Uh, so maybe you're convinced now it might be a good idea to encrypt your stuff. Um, let's see if we can do that, see how that works. Um, I'll try to give a, a very quick overview of some of the um, principles we have here. Um, but if this interests you at all, go take cryptography CSE 323 with Dr. Peterson and learn about this for 10 weeks and not 10 minutes. Um, see what I can do. Uh, so the place we really have to start with cryptography is with um, private key or symmetric encryption. Um, this uh, works in a fairly straightforward fashion. So uh, we have Alice and Bob communicating. They share some, um, some piece of data, some private key K uh, that they keep secret. Um, and we have two algorithms called encrypt and decrypt. Uh, if Bob wants to send a message to Alice, he can um, pass that to the encrypt func function along with the key uh, and get back a ciphertext, this random um, sequence of digits that's totally meaningless to anyone who doesn't have that private key. Uh, so it's safe to send out into the world. Uh, but Alice does have the private key, and she can feed the ciphertext and the key to the decrypt function and get back the original message. Um, and this works great. And we have all sorts of um, solid theoretical ways to do this and efficient algorithms. Um, one of the biggest problems here, though, is key management. How do Alice and Bob agree on this key in the first place? Uh, what if we want to scale beyond more than two people? We have five people. We want any pair to communicate. We have, what, 20 different keys, 10 different keys in the system. Each person needs to now keep secret four keys, one for each other person. Um, and that doesn't scale very well. So let's see if we can do better. And we think we can. Um, now we introduce the notion of public key cryptography. So here we have a more complicated notion of a key. Um, we have some function. Uh, instead of key being a random value, we can generate uh, two keys that we call the public key and the private key. Uh, and these now have some structure to them, and they're related in a very important way. That is, given the uh, public key encryption algorithms, any operation you perform with one key can't be reversed by other people who have that key, but it can be reversed by the other key. And this lets us do some cool things. So we come back to the same scenario again. Um, Alice generates her keys. She puts her public key out there. Uh, she can publish it on the internet. No problem. Uh, Bob can go get that, feed that into his encryption algorithm, send the ciphertext to Alice. And Alice has the corresponding private key. Only Alice has that key. 
so only she can decrypt the message. Um, but now, we, now we've pretty much solved our problems, right? We can send these public keys however we want. Um, nobody has to keep anyone's public key secret. The only thing they have to keep secret is their own private key. Um, also worth noting that we can run this in reverse. Um, Alice can encrypt a message with her private key. And now anyone can decrypt it with her public key. Um, and what you achieve here is Bob can now verify that it was Alice who encrypted that message. If it decrypts with Alice's public key, it must have been encrypted with Alice's private key and therefore by Alice. So Alice can't come back later and say, no, I never promised to pay $500. Um, no, look, you signed it. Uh, we see this used for things like um, signatures on software. You want to be sure your software updates came from the original vendor. So great, you have their public key. You can verify that they signed it with their private key. And now a bunch of nonsense. Um, <laughs> uh, but want to try to give you a feel for uh, one particular public key encryption system that gets used a lot and that gets used in PGP that we'll see later. Um, this is called RSA after Rivest and the other two guys who came up with it. Um, so yeah, see if this makes any sense. This, take, this takes a few lectures to build up the background for in the cryptography course. Um, but basic idea is something like this. So uh, we're doing lots of math. We're doing math in um, Zn, which is a fancy say, way of saying we're doing arithmetic modulo n. Right? So any operation, take the result, um, divide by n, take the remainder. Uh, great. So we're, we're just concerned about the integers from 0 through n minus 1. In this particular system, uh, we start by taking some really big primes. We call them P and Q, prime numbers, um, maybe on the order of 2,048 bits in length. Uh, so 600 digits if you wrote it in decimal. Uh, they're really big numbers. We'll say n is just the product of those two. And we'll define one more thing that turns out to be handy here that we denote by phi of n and call that P minus 1 times Q minus 1. Uh, this turns out to have the handy property when we're working in this system that if you um, raise anything to the power of phi of n, take the result modulo n, you always get 1. Uh, and that becomes useful later. So we still need to encrypt some things. Um, we'll go ahead and pick two more numbers less than n, um, call them e and d for encryption and decryption and pick these in such a way that um, modulo phi of n, their product is 1. Given all that, um, ends up being straightforward to encrypt some stuff. We say our, our message is another number to keep things straightforward. We can encrypt a message by raising it to the power e. Um, Using it to the power e, modulo n, we've got a ciphertext. If we take the ciphertext and raise that to the power d again, OK, so it turns out that's m to the e to the d. It's m to the ed. But wait, we just said uh, e times d is some multiple of phi of n plus 1. OK, great. It's k times phi of n plus 1. And we said that anything to the phi of n is 1. Now that all goes away. We're back to m to the 1, and we've got m back again. The security of this ends up resting on some number theoretical problems that we hope are hard. Uh, in particular, if all you have is e, it's hard to get back to d. Uh, to get d, you would need to know phi of n. To know phi of n, you would need to know p and q. And for that, you'd have to factor n back into its prime factors. Uh, and when n is that big, that turns out to be really hard to do. Um, 
And also, I suppose, given the encrypted message, uh, right, it's m to the e, why can't we take log base e of that and get m back? Um, that turns out to be also very hard to do in this large space, compute a discrete logarithm like that. Did that make any sense? Um, have some idea of <laughs> what's going on here before we move on? <laughs> All right, let's get to PGP and make things even more concrete. So PGP is uh, an encryption software system that's been around a while. Uh, the name just stands for pretty good privacy, and it is pretty good. Um, <laughs> It uh, does all sorts of things. It does symmetric encryption and hashing and whatever. But uh, in particular, it can do public key encryption using RSA uh, and signatures, which we just said was the reverse of encryption, really. Uh, and this is commonly used to encrypt files on a disk, to encrypt emails as they're sent, and things like that. So PGP will store on your computer a whole database of a bunch of keys. Um, you can store public keys of anyone you might want to communicate with. So when you want to send it, you have that key handy. Um, it will store private keys, probably just your own private key. Um, should be all you'll have. And then some extra metadata attached to the keys. So um, most importantly, user IDs, which say this key is owned by this person who has this email address. And these keys themselves then can have these user IDs can get signatures from other keys. And it's just a piece of data. You can sign it. Um, and that turns out to be useful. We'll get back to that in a moment. Um, I had a tiny bit of history to talk about. PGB has been around since 1991, originally created by Phil Zimmerman, uh, and at that time, the export of cryptographic software from the US was still pretty heavily restricted, uh, and he got in some trouble for putting this software out there. So he said, OK, I'll publish a book. In the book will be the complete source code of PGP. The First, First Amendment protects freedom of expression. You can't censor this book. And it went out there. I don't know if people actually used OCR on the book to get PGP in other places, um, but that was interesting. Sometime later, those restrictions were relaxed. Um, at some other time, we got uh, open PGP. It's just a standardization of the protocol that this uses. And then along came the GNU Privacy Guard, GNU PG, or just GPG. Uh, that's an open source impl implementation of that standard by a German programmer and um, <coughs> probably the most widely used implementation today. Along the lines of, of what he was saying about needing to put the source code in a book, um, that, that's, a, that's like a, I mean, I, I consider an issue, an issue that we still see today uh, pretty often. Uh, just the other day, the, uh, the uh, British Prime Minister announced that uh, he basically said that uh, it's wrong for the government not to be able to break encryption on communications, um, which was basically implying that, that there should either be back doors for the government to use or that encryption shouldn't be legal to use at all. Um, and there yep. are also some other issues with that in, uh, I think it was Spain recently. Um, so all the time you hear, you hear people making cases against encryption, even though as we've seen there's, there's lots of good reasons to use it. All right. Um, all right, one more interesting thing to talk about with PGP. Um, so a problem we kind of avoided in talking about public key crypto earlier is you have these public keys. How do you know, how do you trust who they belong to? It says it belongs to Liam. Does it really belong to Liam? If I encrypt something, will Liam be able to read it and not someone else? Um, so various ways to solve this problem. Anyone happen to know how SSL does it? Another big use of public key crypto? Uh, you want to explain so it for us? Certain authorities who are supposed to be trusted, like VeriSign and like 200 others, uh, and they're just big companies who people trust to say, like, this is a good key. And then uh, they can make 
those certificates that you can use. Uh, so you can have like one company like vouchers for you know Google, and then Google can make a bunch of their own certificates for like different websites and stuff, and it all sort of like goes up the tree, like a tree of trust. Right. So we have this hierarchical system of trust, and at the top we have a bunch of organizations that are trusted by all the big operating systems and browsers, and that sort of works all right. Um, until those organizations at the top get compromised and things like that. Um, PGP takes a bit of a different approach here. So I, al I already said um, it supports putting signatures on user IDs to keys. So one key, uh, someone can take their, their private key and someone else's public key with its user IDs and say, I'm signing this user ID. And by doing that, I'm verifying that, yes, this person with this name controls this key. Um, the same thing the SSL certificate authorities do, really. Uh, but in PGP, we end up with this whole web and network of trust of keys, trusting other keys um, that's totally decentralized. Um, and it works out pretty well because uh, trust is transitive in some sense. So I trust who Liam is, but I also trust I also trust Liam to trust who other people are. So if Liam has signed someone's key, that's probably good enough for me to, to trust that that's the right key. Um, so we ran a similar event a year or so ago and got this tiny little network of keys signing each other out of that. Um, yeah, all sorts of fun things. Uh, in PGP world, we also have a whole network of key servers that are just handy ways to get public keys around. There's no need, no need to trust them. We have cryptographic signatures on everything. Um, so we just throw public keys at them and get them back. All right, um, questions on all of that before we get to actually using software and typing on keyboards and things. Or have I just confused everyone? That's possible too. I also want, want to make a quick go for the go for the tutorial, but oh. after the end. I want to make a quick sell to you guys. Um, if you're interested in kind of the the less technical uh, aspects behind cryptography, like the political and philosophical ideas behind it, um, I'm uh, I started the Free Culture Club, which just got its charter a few weeks ago. Um, and uh, we, had, we had kind of an interest meeting about a month ago, and, and about 10, 12 people showed up. Uh, so if that's something you guys are interested in discussing and, and debating, um, there's, a, there's a Cal Poly Free Culture Club Facebook group where you can just come talk to me. Yeah, very cool club. Orion. <coughs> project, you said? Mm -hmm. used to stand for the onion router, but it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Cool. So let's try using all this stuff. Um, I have a whole set of instructions that you can follow here. Um, we'll try to run through this once on the projector, though. So let's see oh. if I can do that. Or you can do that. <laughs> Should I try to, like, no, whatever. <laughs> also weird resolution. All right, so we've got some software installed already. We want to make our own pair of public and private keys uh, and send it out into the world and sign some other keys. Mm -hmm. so, so for this tutorial, we're going to be using uh, uh, GPG for Win is the implementation of, of GPG on Windows. Uh, and then uh, Thunderbird is a mail client by Mozilla, the, the same people who made Firefox. And Enigmail is an add-on for Thunderbird that makes it pretty easy to use uh, GPG with it. Now everyone gets to see my emails. Should everybody be like trying to follow along right now? Or Probably <laughs> not. Yeah, yeah, let's say everyone watch this. Um, all right, so we found Thunderbird. We have Enigma installed. Great. So Let's you should, go to. Yeah, if you go on tools add-ons, you can see I already have um, 
Enigma installed right here. And so we've got an Enigma menu in the toolbar. Great. Uh, then once you have, once you install the add-on and reboot Thunderbird, um, you'll see the Enigma drop down. Uh, if you go to that and go to key management, then uh, and and we'll run through, we'll put up the steps again after this if this, if I'm going pretty quickly through it. Um, but you would go to generate and then new key pair. And assuming that I already have a mail account set up, which can be Gmail or or it, it works with most mail servers and, and they make it pretty easy. They they have some of the settings built in for you. Um, I would choose which identity I want to use for it and then type in a passphrase. Just as a way of protecting the key locally. So if someone gets this file, they still don't have Liam's private key. Right. That, yep. that also means if someone else is using your computer, they can't uh, decrypt emails that you have or, or send emails on behalf of you without your passphrase as well. Mm -hmm. But you end up typing it in a lot. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then I'm going to leave the comment empty. Yeah. Um, key expiry is, is that how you pronounce it? Expiry? Sure. OK. Expiry? 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 Expiration. <laughs> key expiration is basically a way of making sure if you uh, forget the password to the key, uh, or you lose access to it, or, or something like that, then it doesn't just stay out there. At some point, everybody who has your key will see that it expires, and so they'll know that's not a valid key that they should be using anymore. Um, so for, for the purpose of this tutorial, we're going to have you guys set two years on that. Uh -huh. um, but you can always go back and extend that later, as long as you still have the key. Uh, so, um, do you, do you want to that's a handy to default. why it needs randomness? Uh, <laughs> better than this? Probably not. Um, Look at the advanced tab there, though. Oh. Oh, yeah, that's just. Great, and it defaults to 4,096-bit keys using RSA, and that's good. I may have changed that, but, but yeah, that's, that's what OK, it, if it doesn't default to that, change it to that. Uh -huh. um, huh? That's a lot of bits. That's a lot of bits. Yeah, that's basically the length of your key, right? Or length right. Of, yeah. <laughs> so longer ones mean it would be harder for someone to uh, generate the same key and pretend to be you. Um, so when I hit generate key, it's going to ask me to confirm, and then it'll take a few seconds to uh, get enough randomness to generate the, the random numbers that it needs. Um, so if you if you want to like switch to Firefox and switch back, something like that. Basically, any any moving the mouse around and things like that will speed that up if you it's going slowly for you. Uh, gives you <coughs> it gives you the off option to create a revocation certificate here. So uh, in addition to expiration that will just make it become invalid at a certain time, you can save off this extra piece of data somewhere and say if your key ever gets compromised or lost, uh, you can publish that piece of data and that says this key is no longer invalid, no longer valid. Um, so that's probably a good idea to keep around too, if you can keep track of it. And now you need your passphrase. Let's see if I remembered it right. <laughs> uh oh. I'm going to delete it anyway. There we go. Okay. Yay. All right. Revocation certificate. Cool. And then you'll see your new key. You won't have all these that I do. But you'll see your new key, which is this one, show up in the list. And it should be bold, which means that you have both the private and public key stored, as opposed to other keys, which, which will just show up in regular text, which means you only have the public key What's on your system. The, uh, the tell it that expired? That, yeah. that looks expired. Huh? Expired in August. Oh, yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Um, oh. Can I point out the other menu options there with, yeah, without actually running can. through this? Right, I forgot about um, that. So uh, the other thing I want to do here is send keys around and get people to sign keys. This is how we build up the web of trust. Um, there are very elaborate ways to do this. If you go to software conferences, we'll try and do something. Maybe it will be chaos. I don't know. Um, but given this key here, 
what can you say? Or or go to Keith or Rex. All right. Uh, given this key here, we can say uh, send it to one of our key servers, and it doesn't. Uh, so so basically, one one way of doing key exchanges is you have every person uh, either like email their public key to someone else, or email their public key to one person, and then sure. have that person email everything back out. Yeah. Uh, because we have so many people here, we're going to be using key servers, which are basically these websites where uh -huh. you can up upload a copy of your public key and they store it available for anyone to pull off the server. Um, so after you make your key, um, we're, we're all going to be using, uh, and That's... depending on whether you're using GPG tools on Mac or this, the, the steps are a little bit different. Defaults um, change. Um, yes, they, so they all synchronize with each other, but uh, in the interest of getting things done quickly, let's all use the same one. Uh, in particular, how about the MIT key server? which is right there. Um, so you take your new key and say, yes, I want to send this. Let's, I guess let's not send this one. Uh, we can send your old one. We could send either of my, yeah, my other ones. Uh, uh, send pub, or upload public key, key server. At least it expires earlier, so I assume it was created earlier. Hmm. Uh, yay. Send the key up. Um, you can do the reverse to get someone else's public key back. Say search. Um, probably easiest to put in an email here. Or a name, if they have a unique name. If it's a common name, then a million probably. keys will show up. And will it work for us? Hey, there yay, there's our key. We can download it again and import it. And hey, we already had that key. What do you know? Uh, <laughs> Another thing you'll wanna you wanna be sure to do um, if if you just created your own key and you want, and you want to import someone else's key, uh, you'll wanna check to make sure you're downloading the right one uh, because in theory someone there's no sort of uh, they don't check your ID or anything when you submit your key to these servers. So someone could technically actually it, it's pretty funny. I just searched the other day for whitehouse.gov. And all kinds of people create keys for like the president and random like White House email addresses. Uh -huh. um, so you you want to make sure that it is it's the right public key for the person who created it. Um, uh -huh. And what you'll want to do is check the fingerprint with them. Um, um, double check, you know, the, at least the last bit of this, just to make sure you have the same key. Uh, the other thing people usually do is check photo IDs or something just to make sure this is actually the person it says it is. Um, given that, we probably have a way from this dialogue to say, I want to sign this key um, with one of your private keys. I don't care. I probably won't even do it. Um, let's say don't bother about this question now. Nobody has consistent definitions for what those mean. So um, just leave that as it is. Uh, say OK to sign it. Uh, last thing you want to do, which we can't do from here, is send that public key with your signature back to the key server. So everyone else has it, and everyone who trusts you can now trust that key. Yeah, so, so the key server will, will automatically update to the most recent, uh, or like the most recently signed version of the key. It will probably uh, merge them all together even. Yeah. Merge in new signatures. Yeah. So you'll, you'll want to make sure before, the, before other people can see that you sign that key, after you sign it, you want to re-upload it back. So that'll be the same process as we showed you before, uh, where you hit key server, uh, upload key to key server, and then pgp.mit.edu. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, more questions now? You want to dive in and try that? Yes. Uh, what's the point of a revocation certificate? Like, couldn't you just say that it was a bad key and then like post your pub private key and then be like, look, I know that that's mine. And I well, you wouldn't want to post your private key because... Uh, but it's already been compromised. Well, the, the idea it's is that if you, if you submit this revocation certificate to the key server, then it'll gray out your name. And so anyone who maybe hasn't met you in person or hasn't spoken to you who's trying to find a key for you will know not to use that one. 
Yeah, the, yeah, this is all integrated into the software system, so it'll say, I see a revocation certificate, I'm not going to use that key at all. Um, right, it'll be grayed out, just, just right. like the one you see. The Daniel expired one? Crawl up there, uh -huh. same, same as the uh -huh. expired. Okay. And, and besides getting keys compromised, if you have the key lost, okay, now you can't post your private key. Um, but you might still have your revocation certificate around to say, I lost this key, don't use it. Um, but you can create that at any time as long as you still have the private key. Okay, um, so I say you all go ahead and try it. Uh, there are a few of us here who have some idea of what we're doing. Could try and help you out, <coughs> raise your hand. You can also set up uh, GPG really easily to sign uh, GitHub releases and stuff. And, uh, Git tags, yeah. Uh, Git, uh, Git tags actually the like, resource you want, I think. Yeah. Other cool uses for GPG. Yeah. Yes. There's a few. There's a few probably that actually do it. So yeah. Mm. Yeah, and then you can you can encrypt and sign email. You can encrypt and sign email attachments. Um, you can encrypt text. Uh, Files on disk. Yeah. Um, one one thing that is important to remember as well is when you send uh, encrypted emails, it doesn't encrypt any of the metadata. So that means who the email is from, who the email is to and the subject won't be encrypted. Uh, so, so what I usually do if I'm sending someone an encrypted email is I leave the subject empty um, just because it <coughs> makes right. it more secure. 